Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the Lo-Fi Lounge. I have two poets, two, count them, two. Uh, poets, uh, Charlotte Muse and Patrick Daly, uh, who are, are connected, but we won't talk about that till the end. Uh, but we have two books that are a pleasure to have read and, and have some questions about. One is... Um, you, in which I forgive the river. That's by Charlotte Muse. Grief and Horses by Patrick Daly. So it uh, is a connection uh, that was made through a, another poet, friend of ours, uh, who's been on our, sh our show, uh, Phyllis Klein. And uh, so we did a little emailing and got a chance to to look at the most recent books. And I'm glad that both of you guys are here. Thank you for having us. Yes. Two very, very powerful works. What I'm going to do, we just start uh, with, with Charlotte and, and just look at this, this new collection in which I forgive the river. There's something that's said on the back in the praise, the praise section, right at the back of the book, uh, that is very, very true from my uh from my reading of this, uh, is this, uh, these are poems that are about everything in the world, the whole world. Uh, there, you know, it ranges from very subtle and clever uh, revelations about small things, an owl or a bee or, a, you know, a frog. And there's just as easily you swing into the mind of a torturer who's describing his craft. And so it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky book because you might read one poem from here and say, oh, this, this is very pleasant. There's, there's a bee. This is nice. And then whew, something happens as does life uh, that's really difficult. And so it's, it's a wonderful combination, a journey that, that is heavy and light and dark. Um, so, so Charlotte, uh, I'm so, so glad that you're here with us. That's just a little introduction. It's just the first impression that I had reading your book over this last week. Uh, so how are you doing, my friend? Well, um, fine, thanks. Um, I, I'm glad you, uh, I, I, that I, I didn't think of it, of, of writing that way. I, I just, um, one thing that I do when I write is um, I'm, um, I often pick something like um, stories or um, the history of the violin or um, uh, owls, you know, and I, and then I write some, and even better butterflies, you know, um, that some people think of poets as people who sit there and, and watch butterflies. And I actually have done that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so just something to kind of um, organize my ideas around. Um, so anyway, um, and also just uh, pictures uh, like from a, a book at the library, or I, I find it just as good to, to look at something and then you can kind of see through it. Poems that you have, is this cinematic? In a way, the very first poem, I mean, uh, you know, why are we afraid of the road? It it gets me in that car. <laughs> I'm in that car with uh, with that person. Do you want to read that poem? Why you're afraid of the road? There is room for one car, but what if the wheels miss and the car hangs over the edge with two tires spinning? You'd be moving frantically against the door, hoping to keep the balance or get out. Never would the yellow dust of the road seem so desirable, the blue sky so thin and threatening, and you a turned over turtle, a blind bird. Or what if you just drove off the edge because you were tired of all curves and wanted to lie on air? Whether or not spirits come back empty and blue and unable to hold anything, you could say you'd gone into their place in your body. Of course you love life. It holds you as hard as death does. Everything holds you but the air, 
And this is why you're afraid of the road. I was just going to say that <clears throat> that is one of my favorite poems in the book. Actually, one of my favorite poems Charlotte has written. I think it's a, a wonderful poem. And of, and um, I do know the road she's talking about. And um, uh, you might think, <laughs> you might worry about going off the edge. Yeah. Right. It, that, that is a, These are poems, and, and I think in bo for both of you guys, uh, these are poems about real places. So it's so interesting, Charlotte, that you mentioned sometimes, you know, <clears throat> just a picture that you'll pull it from. But in that poem, I, I, uh, I think you kind of capture that space. Uh, and this happens throughout the collection uh, where the next step has deep significance. It's like, what could happen next? Later on, you, 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 you do when you, uh, in, in the river one, when you forgive the river, is that where you go creates the significance. And it's what I love about that poem is very, when you were uh, putting the collection together, did you, did you know that's, I want to, this is my hit here. At the uh, it's really strange because um, I still keep editing this book in my head and, you know, <laughs> I still wish I had put these in and not put those in. And, oh, yeah. and I, and I, I, there's a young man I, I know who's a, I think is a fine poet. And I said, you know, you need to send your, your manuscript out. And he said, I can't pick the poems. I can't figure out which ones to put in. And I had to tell him, I, I can't either. I don't know how to do it. You know, uh, I have loads of poems and every day I wish I'd put that one in and taken this one out or something. I don't know. It's the, it's the, uh, the curse of a creative person is that I think in any field, you're never done, you know? And when you write something, if given time, you'll, you'll wanna flip two words, but thank goodness there's <laughs> editors or people who tell us, uh, let's move forward and go with that sequence. But what's powerful about, about that poem too is I, I do think it, it, it sort of sets the stage for this uh, journey of where you're headed and the consequences of 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 you know of these short uh, short steps, the great horned owl and what happened. Yeah, I love that poem. Well, this one's from my. I have a well. Here, I'll show you this book. This is uh, this is a handmade uh, letterpress edition that someone made of this book. And yes, and. Uh, Anyway, uh, that the Chester Creek Press made, and it's a beautiful thing. The guy even made the paper, and it, it's just lovely. Um, but anyway, I, these are the poems of uh, stories of Ascension Solorsano, who yeah. was the last native speaker of the Mutsun tribe. Anyway, I'll read this, okay? Uh, the Great Horned Owls and What Happened. And then in the beginning, I, I, this is just a little thing of what she wrote in what she said. And they say that long ago, men used to go and throw rocks at the great horned owls just to teach, tease them and make them talk. They said bad words. And at last the great horned owls would answer back. The owls used to fight with the men until they scratched them, Ascensio and Solorsano. So then this is my poem. There was a tree where the owls used to gather and sing. Ooh, ooh, the owls in the tree. Ooh, they'd croon. Forget about the hunt. We only want each other and the moon. We owls are going to tell the night what song is and how much we love the lake. Who hasn't wanted a strong branch and company to sit with in starlight and sing? Who, who, the owls with the horns, doing the great horned owl, do, ooh, do, ooh. But over in the village, men and boys got together. It's a slow night, nothing going on. Let's go take on the owls. Silent as water, they seeped through the grasses and pow, they exploded right near the owl tree. Ho, oh, owls, you sing through your asses. You can't tell a song from a fart. The song slid away and went to look for someone merry. The owl sat silent as clocks all their yellow eyes glaring out from feathered sockets. Then, we lords of the dark wing, lords of the hunt, far seers, stone-clawed makers of the moon's own music, ask you, 
why do you provoke us? But the men spoke no well. They picked up rocks. Stupid birds just want to sit up there and yodel. The owls flew down in fury. You ruin, you ruin. The men only laughed and clubbed them away. A few scratches later, they went home. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, the owls shrieked into the jangling air. They never came back to the tree. That song in that place is gone. But they bided their time until they got a man alone and swarmed at his face and killed him, then pulled out his eyes. That's what happens when. Who called the dark down? Was it already there, coming out of nowhere to dye the story black? Or does anybody know? I wish I knew. Someone who can tell a different story. Who called the dark down? Your poem reminded me of a story. Uh, uh, James Thurber, these fables, you know, uh, further fables for more time. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, and he had these wonderful fables that are a little quirky and a little dark. And it, as soon as I saw the word owl, <laughs> I was taken to, I was taken to a place. Hold it. That call the owl who was God. Oh wow, that's <laughs> <laughs> which is Great. a conversation the other animals think he's wise because he always answers everything with two words, to, to who, to what, to <laughs> <laughs> they decide that he's God and they follow him everywhere, even during the daytime when he can't see and he leads them out in the middle of a road and a car runs them all over and kills them. <laughs> it's just a, that conversation with that owl between nature, but in this poem, the what we don't understand about nature and our fellow participants in nature, just it just comes through. And what are the consequences? What are the life and death's consequences? And we don't speak owl. It's just, it's a fabulous poem. And it, and it, it there seems to be a series of fable-like poems to where, where uh, a deeper truth is told in, in kind of a simple story. Thank you. Let's talk about Ascension because that's a big part of the book too. Uh, this, you know, this storyteller, this healer, this part of this community uh, whose words documented essentially the horrors of, the, of that time. You have a series of poems that float through that book, uh, through this collection. So yeah, tell me about it. Well, um, I have a, a friend, uh, his name is um, Eric Remington, and he actually kind of lives off the land. He's a brilliant, he's the most brilliant naturalist I've ever known. He, he's, he can catch a snake with his hand, uh, I mean, just like that. He gave me uh, the unpublished, uh, he just handed me the unpublished manuscript of Ascension Solorsano, who died in 1930. She, she knew she was dying, um, the year before that, I guess. She knew she was dying, and she went to bed, and she put on her black dress and went to bed and waited to die, but she didn't die. And so they sent um, to Washington to John Harrington, who was the Smithsonian's foremost ethnologist and he came racing out to California um, and sat by her bedside while she told him as many stories and as much about her language as as she could you know wow. and so all these strange series of coincidences happened to me after that I went to um, to San Juan Batista the the Mutsun tribe of whom she was a member were forced to build the, the, myth, the mission there, Mission San Juan Batista. And so they kind of, you know, they basically enslaved the Indians to, to build the mission and through, and so, you know, her parents were born there at the mission and she knew all these stories. So I, um, I got to meet some of the people, some of the members of the Mutsun tribe uh, and there are still, they, there, there were still some people there running a cafe. They still are, um, uh, and um, and I got to go to one of their dances and various other things like that happened. But 
I thought maybe I might read, if you don't mind, just a very small um, poem, but it's a tribute to her, Ascension, Sil Arsenault. It's very short. She was like a river with power like strong water or in her beginnings, a small runnel that feeds on whatever feeds it. The rain rains, the stream picks up stones, picks up sand, debris, pieces of shell, worn out shoes, bones. It keeps flowing, blood from the heart of the world. It doesn't matter to a river what makes it grow larger. Doña Ascension was like that. She took everyone who came to her into herself. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the Lo-Fi Lounge, Charlotte Muse and Patrick Daly. But we have two books that are a pleasure to have read and, and have some questions about. One is um, In Which I Forgive the River, that's by Charlotte Muse, Grief and Horses by Patrick Daly. Well, maybe I'll read Stradivari's Ghost oh, into okay. the Future. This was during my violin period, <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> um, so Stradiv everybody knows who Stradivari was. Stradivari's ghost speaks to the future. Well, maybe I'll read Stradivari's ghost oh, speaks yeah, to okay. the future. This was during my violin <laughs> period, <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> um, so Stradiv everybody knows who Stradivari was. Stradivari's ghost speaks to the future. Look for me through the murky water of the years. The sun comes in like a distant fire. One of the fish in a school is me. Or imagine my shape as a cello, if you like, with a shirt hung on it, then arms, then legs. Use any face you want, nobody ever painted mine. Can you hear me? I will call to Francesca or to one of the children. Listen. I'll test an instrument. Listen. I'm sitting on my bench in the roof, on the roof in fine weather, surrounded by shavings. Below is the din of Cremona. Do you see my tools laid out, the violins wet with varnish drying on a rack? I'm only asking you to imagine what you yourself have heard and seen. A man at work with his chisels and planes, his patterns, his woods, his hands, his ears. Each decision means work, refusals, time, the wearying demands of perfection. I made perfect things. I made violins which hold the whole world. But I beg you now, imagine a life for me, the way Francesca could say Antonio so that I heard nothing else. The mornings when we stayed in bed until the children climbed in laughing. Days with the sun on the river and birds flying, please, let me live for a moment before I return to the tower of my name. I was a man until I turned to music. Hmm. Jeez, go ahead, Patrick. No, I think I think that's a that's a poem about about art and about um, you know all artists. I think in some corner of their soul yearn for fame and for you know a name that endures. Um, and um, I think this poem captures beautifully how how much we don't want that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> you don't want to be trapped in something. Yeah. Trapped in. Yeah. Yeah. Did that challenge uh, did you made the perfect thing? Then then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> yeah, right. Where is there to go now? <laughs> what have you done? Well, it's a little like Ernest Hemingway. You see, he was always looking for, he wanted to write the, the perfect sentence, or, you know, the, the sentence with meaning. When he couldn't write the perfect sentence anymore, he didn't have any uh, reason to live. Yeah, I haven't written the perfect song yet, so I, I'm good. <laughs> uh, but for Patrick, uh, his grief and horses. 
he is a very, you know, is, is full of life, is full of animals, <laughs> dotted with animals. Uh, they tell our tale, uh, where you see the street person and the raven, and you pull those two things together, and and you know, they swirl together in this poem. The the poem, another crow. This is um, this is actually one of my favorite poems of, of mine. Me too. <laughs> Another crow. It lifted itself from a branch and flew and settled. How black it shone against the gray of not yet spring, stark as the bare tree. For a wing beat, I felt myself pitching into crow, all the not enough that is bird in me, wanting to fan out into black, to feel the inklings of blackness prickle my veins, while a black beak began to refine my bones. How strong longing is. I was ready to let go and take that cold, bright, prying grip upon the world just across the road in one beat and glide to stretch wings at the tip like aching fingers and stall and settle. For three moments of flight, I would have ceased this human leaning into otherness and leapt into crow forever. And though I was not bird enough, too much a man waiting for a bus under low cloud, I felt my balance tip crowwood by a feather, a tickle of black brilliance, something light as a shadow across my heart. I, I love that poem too. I, you know, I, I just think it's, um, it, it is, as you say, like almost, almost a, a, an eerie um, sort of synthesis. I mean, to someone whose imagination can go in, you know, who, who can almost turn into crow. Right. Um, I, I just think it's a very daring and wonderful image. Uh, I, I, I love that poem. <laughs> it, but I, I, and I think it's the whole book has these kind of series of transformative moments to where you're entering in, uh, whether it's the jam, <laughs> <It's on. laughs> whatever it is it keeps you keep being you know drawn into being the other and I, that's why i love that poem it's this one sentence that says why it may not be possible you know to say i'm not burnt enough to completely make this transformation but it, is it important to join the other patrick is it important to do well of course there's a there's an irony in the poem in that while I'm saying, you know, I would have ceased this human leaning into, into other, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm wanting to be a crow. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'm saying, well, the only way to, the only way to go is to become a crow and I, and I can't. And I think without, I hope being pompous, there is something about the human condition in that we are homo sapiens sapiens. We know that we know. Um, but we can't, except when we can in some ways, but we can't transform ourselves. We can't, you know, the animals in Charlotte's book, uh, the men who become bear, she didn't read that one. Maybe, right. maybe, maybe we'll have time. And, and no, we'll, let's do it. we'll do it for sure, yeah. Um, those men do become, but they're, they're terrible, you know, in, right. in, at least in that story and in, in, in the Charlotte's poem. Um, it's a terrible thing to so i i think it is as as creatures we are we are we are entirely trapped by our curiosity and yet trapped is wrong because that's that's curiosity is a wonderful thing it's it's mm -hmm. what makes us want to learn about the world um and it what what perhaps makes us of value to the world if you know if we can get past all the 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 enormities that we commit upon the world um our, our genuine 
curiosity, which is perhaps close to love, like Charlotte's Mountain, um, that not only might save us, but it might it might save the world. But anyway, um, that's that's straying. There is one thing that I wanted to say about that poem, which I think maybe is of interest um, to other people who you know who write and or um, create any form of art. I wonder if this is generally true. That poem was relatively easy to write, but it came right after a poem that I'd struggled with for months and that never never really worked and was never really good. And it's completely different from this. And then um, and then I wrote this, as I say, and, and by at least by my standards, I don't write easily. Um, by my standards, that, that that was a relatively easy poem to write. So I wonder if that's something, there's something true about the, the creative process there that you're, you're, you know, you put huge effort into something um, that may or may not be successful, um, but it, it enables the next thing. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the Lo-Fi Lounge, Charlotte Muse and Patrick Daly. But we have two books. One is um, In Which I Forgive the River, that's by Charlotte Muse, Grief and Horses by Patrick Daly. Uh, but for Patrick, uh, his Grief and Horses, you have some political pieces that are in here that Again, a little like with Charlotte's book, you're following a bee, and then you're with the torturer, and uh, the some of the political pieces that are in here are very, very, um, very powerful. And in I had almost forgotten about Tiananmen Square. How easy it is to forget as these yeah. horrible things pile up. How well, the Chinese it? government has been very assiduous in trying to make us forget about Tiananmen yeah. Square. Yeah, uh, I mean, do you want to read that? I mean, it's it's a, it's a left turn, but it's, it, it's powerful. It, it's long. Um, it's okay. Okay. Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square, um, and this was in 1989, of course. Um, the poem is in a couple of sections, and the first section is the people in frescoes digest the news. It was actually, the restaurant was actually fresco, but everyone called it frescoes and they had great breakfast. <clears throat> the people in frescoes digest the news. They have their noses in the hot, dark story of coffee. They have ordered eggs and bacon. The place is filled with the warmth of coming food. How to swallow a bullet is not on the menu. The sturdy man on the front page, shaking a helmet in his fist and dirty with what looks like oil running off his face down his shirt. Surely what has happened to him can be washed off. The page would be sodden. This would be a black place of weeping. There'd be no pleasure in the hips of waitresses bringing fresh orange juice and oatmeal, pancakes, waffles with whipped cream and strawberries, iced tea, if a picture could seize the mind and penetrate at the pitch of the appetites. Built of indestructible styrofoam, flesh of the flesh of a billion takeout cartons, the goddess of democracy is trash. Those who linked arms to protect her and those who left peacefully as they came hand in hand and those who stood in a long line across the road waiting while foot soldiers crouched between the tanks and took aim. And those who, stand, who then stepped up and stood in the same place. We never imagined them dead. 
We thought it was the old argument between old people and young people resting ground inch by inch as parents and children do. We didn't guess the parents would kill their children. It was a different kind of bargaining, Patrick Henry's kind. It was a claim on us. Brave Chinese students, do not be insulted by salaried hands in Palo Alto turning the page, leafing in the classified ads. Frivolity is human, it smacks of happiness. Thomas Jefferson is to blame for us as he is for you. The map of shed blood dissolves in the repetitions of a machine that drops an orange a foot down onto a gleaming plate and garrots it and the juice runs out and it grabs another. And the person watching, free to pay attention to what he likes in the sweet smelling pocket of time that is his, is living the life you were looking toward from that pure distance. What you died for is here, but there is nothing better anywhere than what you were. And those who pulp the boy faces of soldiers with rocks and shoes, and those who burn them out of their tanks like wasps and pulled off their limbs. Second part of the poem is called Easy to Break, Difficult to Dispose of. And it has an epigraph uh, from the Declaration of the Hunger Strikers. The price of democracy and freedom is our life. Can the Chinese people be proud of this? Would you have hardened like them, Li Peng and Deng Xiaoping, and Li Peng and Deng Xiaoping, evil old men, burning the bodies of their grandchildren to no avail, the stink will last while there are people to breathe? Would you have softened like us? Would you have sat at the counter and stirred in sugar next time they jammed the helmets on and stuffed their ears and snuggled the sweating guns? Would you have found a new way? Night and morning on the news, you spoke your alien evenly diced sounds. Familiar though to that part of us that never stops wishing to be mended. We do not think of democracy as a goddess, but we took her for what is, it is to be whole and spilt. The taste hangs in the air. Even the new way lost is less bitter than the old foulness, the old sweetness. And here are a couple of lines from the Tao. Seeing the small is insight, yielding to force is strength. If men are not afraid to die, it is of no avail to threaten them with death. Walking along the marsh edge, turning this over while in the cord grass, the bird sang its two bright notes, two dark notes over and over. I broke a stalk of anise and the tart new smell burst out. More new than tart, more fresh than anything. But these lies offered in the hope of freedom and taken. It's it's uh, epic, and it's uh, and it is difficult to read. I could tell uh, that it's very emotional, uh, and anyone who who reads it will feel that. But anyone who hears you read it uh, becomes it, and it's uh, that distance between you know, who we're going to be. It's very potent right now with the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Beijing. Yeah. Well, not only that, but you know, now it's our our democracy is is threatened. Oh, absolutely. Uh, seriously yeah. threatened. Well, uh, which you have in the on building a house. Yeah. Do we have time? Maybe I would read that. Yeah. No. No, I love that poem. How to unbuild a house. They start with a reciprocating saw. It cuts wood and masonry and snarls like anger. But our neighbor is not angry. 
only bored with her house, tearing it down for a tower. What are the spirits, the life gone into the walls of the house, generation upon generation until the house is laid like the ground it stands on and unfolds like a tree? It takes strong tools to cut down the tree that is a house, a tigerish snarling. But these men are just men, whistling and chatting. The tiger is elsewhere. What if this were that other house and all that is in it? What do you need to fell the tree that is a nation? Is a mob enough? An angry man, red and orange like a flame? A mob with guns and blunt weapons, handcuffs and a gallows? How much blood on faces, clothes, the ground? How many shots? How much bludgeoning to death? How many tools sharp and blunt, how much power is enough to bite up the roof and walls and rooms of a great house till it falls? What does it take to scatter the souls that lean together so long they seemed like one soul? All the joys and makings and memories and miseries of a nation to crumble it all to dust in the air. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the Lo-Fi Lounge. Charlotte Muse and Patrick Daly, in which I forgive the river. That's by Charlotte Muse. Grief and Horses by Patrick Daly. Mountain, it's an old poem, but um, maybe I'll read it. Sure. Somewhere a mountain sh shoulders over a great plain. Animals cross it, only specks. A few decorative clouds, grasses, trees, and then the green, brown, white of the mountain. To travel far enough away to make the mountain disappear is to go to another place. A kind of love is pulled out of every watcher's eye. The mountain won't love you back, people say. <clears throat> to a man who lived in that country dressing each morning in mountain colors, a time came when he thought he needed to be saved from looking at the mountain. Only rain forced his eyes away. He longed for loving kindness and for boundary, for what was small and would die before he did, for escape from the silent answer to his unshaped question. Who can put faith in rain? It's only water. But one morning, a drop on its way down is caught by a thorn and settles on that small claw. The man wandering notices. He gazes through the water drop and there is the mountain, small and perfect in the prism of water. Everywhere there are mountains trembling on the ends of pine needles and grass blades, moving as the hairs of animals move until heat comes to take the freshness. All this sparkling, not warm like love, but like singing. The man rejoices, though he's weary of the mountain and the space it takes up in his heart. Mm. I guess that was something about poetry or writing it or having an art that I'm sure that you understand. <laughs> well, you know, it's just like the, just the little drop that contains the whole mountain. I guess what poets try to do, right? I mean, so we, we only have words and we only <laughs> have so much, so much space and <laughs> right. trying to capture a mountain. And it's just how, what you found in that poem is, is unique about poetry itself. Patrick, I see you thinking down there. Right? <laughs> no, I think that um, I think the poem is about love and <laughs> and um, the space it takes up in your heart and um, and it hadn't really occurred to me that it was about about art, um, but it does seem to apply to love as well. I think art is love. 
know, I think whatever art, you know, making songs, yeah. making poems, making whatever, it's it's attention. And as I think it was someone said, Gorgiev, attention is love. Yeah. Patrick, do you have a, a poem a similar from from this thing, uh, from this book, uh, that that you feel is like a transformation style poem? Another poem that's sort of about transformation. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is a <laughs> this is another bird, but the tone is very very different. Um, hen and pastry bag. Oh yes, and this is in the voice of the hen. Um, and it was a gorgeous, beautiful hen. Um, hen and pastry bag. Glorious I am, my pyramid tail of flame and gold, my silk fine neck turnings. Beauty, gently as I wear it, is what I bring to the morning light. Stooping, inspecting, not that, not that. But now this is an opening, delicious, delicious, surely safe to put my head in. All this is the small work of the day, the great work. Ah, uh, the sun in the tower of my tail, my neck turning and turning, the silk of me flowing and changing. So that's... <laughs> That's just a little lightweight poem, but um, like but I wanted to celebrate the beauty of the hen. Yeah. Okay. There's a Amazon Alexa started talking to me. <laughs> First, I thought it was the hen. You know. Hello, folks. Uh, welcome to the Lo-Fi Lounge. Charlotte Muse and Patrick Daly, in which I forgive the river. That's by Charlotte Muse. Grief and Horses by Patrick Daly. Eight months you wore a black dress. You got eight months out of it. She got eight months out of it, and we got all these stories. So I yeah. wanted to publicize them because no one's read them. You know. Well, it's a wonderful part of the book. It's just, it's, it's a different uh, part of the river and, and you go over to the spot and you keep coming back to it. The one poem I was going to ask you to read from that because it's very powerful. It's very uh, somber. Digging at night. Digging at night. The Indians were working digging a ditch day and night and what do you think death was there too working along with them with her ha hair tied up. Ascension Solar Singer. After the Padre told them to dig a trench, they asked him how wide, but though he said it was for water, he measured himself head to toe and added six inches. And how long? Dig until I tell you to stop. And so they worked night and day on the trench. Back in the settlement, people groaned and vomited or lay naked with the pox while flies left eggs on their sores and the diggers dug the, dug the trench. They did not believe it was for water. The sounds of the shovel, that ih, when blade hits earth, the thud of clods, they heard these in their dreams. When the woman first appeared, some said they had seen her among the houses, but no one knew her name. She would arrive each night with the rise of the Thule fog and the fall of dark. And how old was she? Who could tell with her hair and her face wound with cloth? Out in the gloom filled with cricket whir and twig snaps, coyote howls, small creatures hiding from owls and the indifferent stars, she never spoke. The moon left her eyes alone. Those who saw her face said her eyes were slitted and her mouth wide open. She'd move her head slowly as a deaf person might or lift it or whip it around like a fast, like a spinning leaf, though you never felt a wind. 
It was said that she put her back into the work, spading deftly, flinging up soil, and now and then looking around her as if she were burying treasure. And then I just have at the end, in the year 1812 alone, 1179 Indians died of cholera and smallpox at Mission San Juan Batista. They were buried in their blankets without coffins in a mass grave. <clears throat> I use the term Indians because um, she did, and also because I think Native American is a bad, they weren't American, they were here long before this was America. It goes back to that these uh, poems are coming from something that's real. You know, I think sometimes in poetry, people imagine that poets are abstract or they just trying to conjure something. These, this is a received message from her yeah. to you, to the poem and then back out again. The reality of the book started to settle the more poems that were, were triggered with her thoughts. It gives this gravity to the book that always brings you, you know, to the real. Again, the power of poetry to summarize and shine a light, you know, to summarize and uplift. That's it's about what, witness. It's what I like a lot about your book is that it, and it takes risks and that it goes from light to dark and light to dark and light to dark. I kind of like that final transformation in, um, in the title poem, In Grief and Horses, uh, uh, because there is a final transformation. Do you want to read that? This is the title poem, Grief and Horses, and um, it's in memory of my dad. <clears throat> The horses on the other bank, waiting as ours cross the soaking, sucking meadow and clomp in the fast water too strong for our feet. Their rumps to us, their riders letting them graze, their haunches bunching as they shift their weight and easing, bunching and easing like water over a rock gathering and falling. The sun on bay, pink dappled, snow melt spotted brown flanks that make you think of the ruddy cones of fallen pines, rings that counted the years, crumbled and spilt, softening into dust. How hard it is to write this beauty aright, that the earth with so little effort raises up and with less, scarcely a shiver, sucks back when it falls. Every hold, relaxes in time, and this means death to us, and the tearing effort of grief that is much like dying, like bursting through something that still resists, a great handsome horse sure of its path, surging where we did not think a path could be made, strong, cold, white as water falling. It's just a fantastic uh, ending to a, a challenging collection, right, Patrick? I mean, you take on so many different things. And uh, uh, when you were finishing that poem and you knew, you know, it was this final transformation that you're describing. I, how, was that really difficult to, to work through? This has been a hard poem to, to weather, not necessarily right. They've... I think they, you know, psychologists say that um, the more difficult your relation with a with a parent who dies, the the harder it is to deal with, the death is to deal with, and um, both things are true. Uh, I loved my father dearly, and um, he was um, in many ways not good for me. Um, I'm sure I was in many ways. I know I was in many ways not not good for him. Um, so. It was a struggle that wasn't resolved before he died. Um, the last time we met was was wasn't good, um, and um, and it took so it 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 took me a long time to to even begin to deal with that. And um, I 
I don't know, honestly, you, I don't think one can tell at that level of, of um, closeness to oneself, to one's heart, whether writing a poem helps or right. not. Um, but I, I like the poem because I think it gets away from me and my dad. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I, I think um, it says, it does say what I, what I know about grief. Um, and someone asked me, or actually several people asked me why I called the collection Grief and Horses. Um, it's funny because more than one person who didn't know each other said, you know, that's a, that title just reminded me of someone that I love who died, who loved horses. Two people, two different people said that. Mm. Um, uh, but that's, um, I think my take on the, on, on, on this as a title for the book is that horses are very powerful creatures. Um, we can control them and we have domesticated them and yet they retain more than any other domesticated animal, perhaps, um, that sense of power and the sense of, of what we don't, we don't contain, we don't control. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, um, horses can take us places that where we, we can't go ourselves. Um, this was on a trip, as you may be able to tell, and a horse trip into the Sierras. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we wouldn't have been, Charlotte and I would not have been able to walk there carrying our, our packs and our, you know, the, our gear. Um, but the horses could carry us. And I hope this doesn't seem glib, but I, I would like to think that poetry does that too. It takes you where you, where you couldn't otherwise go. Um, and, uh, we have that if, when we read a poem that we love, I think there are two things that, that might happen either separately or, or even at the same time. One is that feeling of, oh yes, I knew that, but I didn't know I knew it. Mm. Or, or else perhaps just a sense of wonder of, of yes, but I never would have suspected that. Um, that poem took me, I mean, people say that, took, that poem took me somewhere. And I think that's as as a poet, that's that's what you what you, what you hope to do. What what I am always grateful in in other poems, other people's poems that I love is is that it it took me somewhere that I that I couldn't have gone myself. Right. Well, it's a gift, you know, uh, that strong horse that is a poem. last how flows it with two creative souls with you two guys how do you influence each other how, how do you get in each other's way how does that work probably all go? of the above <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think um i think it you know we've been married for a long time uh, well, I mean, we've been married. Seems like just yesterday. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I, um, we, we have two other friends who are married poets. I mean, mm -hmm. two other couples, and they, they all, they live near us. <laughs> wow. And so it's interesting because, you know, they kind of um, sort of, you I, you know, it's the same kind of thing, but I think that we have come to a place where we really do um, help each other. Well, are, are you finished? I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, yeah. but I wanted to say that, that Charlotte really um, is an extraordinary teacher. I mean, she, she does teach poetry, but um, she brings that quality of attention um, as a teacher to, 
to everything, you know, everything that I show her, everything that, you know, other friends of ours, other workshop participants of ours uh, that we know, um, bring her. Um, and it is something, something really quite extraordinary. And um, I, I've said in the acknowledgements that she's made every single one of those poems in my book better than it was going to be and I that's that's no exaggeration it might be an understatement um so it's um from on the receiving end um what Charlotte has has given me as a poet is 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 more than I I can say um and I have never been, you know, in in her league as as far as that goes. But I have been trying over the years to learn, <laughs> um, to learn something of of her quality of attention and and her ability to um, to point you to 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 where you can you can go further or where I think. Certainly, when I was younger, I was always looking for ways to to get out of a poem. You know, is this done now? I'm pretty sure it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> right. This is, you know, this is this is I'm, this this is pretty good value for money. Let's let's leave it here. And um, Charlotte would not let me do that. And occasionally, she's been wrong. You know, occasionally I wrecked a poem because um, uh, that it just that the, there hasn't been more there. Um, or it, it hasn't, you know, there's, there's, there's this mysterious stuff that we've been talking about when you're trying to create something yeah. and you can break it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, in, in, in listening to anybody's criticism, even if it's very, very good, you have to be aware of that. This poem, you know, just may not be, um, may not have that much flexibility or that much material substance in it to to go where someone else thinks it might be able to go but but anyway um this is a very long-winded way of saying that i owe charlotte an enormous debt of gratitude um and um and i hope i'm learning to to be of some use to her um but but the the debt is all on my side well i don't believe that for a minute but <laughs> And I, I guess I have to say that the debt on my side to Patrick is his largeness of mind. You know, he, he, um, he's an extraordinary talented poet. And, you know, he, um, I, I think that I have a narrower focus, but he has a much broader one. And, uh, you know, he, um, He's not afraid to um, to tackle, you know, some some very large questions. And not only is he not afraid to, but he has the largest of mind to be able to do it. Mm. And um, you know, that is something I don't know if you can learn, but I try to learn that from him. Well, I know that uh, this has been a remarkable uh, interview. Because we, and we, we only know each other through the poems to start with, right? But we end up you know, an hour later uh, in a whole other uh, depth of understanding, and we went to funny places and dark places, and in what wonderful a team you guys are! Oh, but you. what creative powers you have individually, and I think that anyone who's uh, you know. Like suppose so it's gonna are gonna they're gonna pick this up through these books, but I I think they're gonna like this interview too. I think they're gonna enjoy our conversation because it's uh oh uh, it's just real and uh, and, yeah. and it's authentic. Yeah. Well, thank you for your attention and your your perceptive questions and and comments. It's um. It's been a rare experience. And thank you, Charlotte Muse. And thank you, Patrick, daily for, for yourselves. <laughs>